The Get Down is brought to you by Digital Music Pool. Digital Music Pool is the ultimate record pool for professional DJs looking for the hottest tracks and exclusive hits updated daily in an easy-to-use platform. You can find exclusive edits from myself, Cream, Adam B., Andrew Marks, Angelo the Kid, Armin Averro, Chumpian, Dan FX, Castra, Pat C., and Samus J. only on DMP. And we're giving you a chance to try their service for just $9.99 for the first month. All you have to do is click the link in the show notes or on the Get Down or Cream Instagram pages, create an account, and enter the promo code CREAM at checkout for your discounted month. DMP is my go-to record pool for new and exclusive music to play in my sets. So become a member for just $9.99 for the first month with the code CREAM and check it out for yourself. Click the link in the show notes or on the Get Down or Cream Instagram pages to sign up now. You will not be disappointed. If you love listening to The Get Down, you will love the video version of our show on YouTube even more. With all new audio and video upgrades, we've taken the show to the next level. On YouTube, you get to see our facial expressions, hand gestures, and real passion we have for this industry and for helping you grow your DJ business. Click the link in the show notes or on the Get Down Instagram page to watch the podcast now or search Get Down DJs on YouTube. We would greatly appreciate if you subscribe to our channel, like, and comment any questions you might have that we could bring up on the show. What's up, guys? Welcome to 143rd episode of The Get Down, brought to you by Digital Music Pool. My name's Cream. Gary W. here. Welcome back, Gary. Welcome home. Back to Florida. Thank God. It was so effing cold up there, man. It was re- like it was properly cold. It was of it reminded me of January's past in New Jersey, that's for sure. It was really um, cold here. And then yeah. I thought it was cold here, and then I went to Detroit on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole different kind of cold uh, up there. I've never been up there, and for good reason. <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> I mean, I've tra- I've cruised up into Canada, and like I, and that was in July, and it was like fifty, and I was like, yeah, no, we're good, we're good on, on ever coming back up this way. Um, but yeah, we'll get it. Let's we'll, we can get into Detroit. Uh, let's talk maybe a little bit about New Jersey and my trip up and a lot of things happening for us as far as, you know, everybody has their holiday parties in January. So our final holiday party it was our own. Do, <laughs> we're never doing it. Well, we're never doing ours again in January. We're going to move ours. The get down the holiday year. party is officially a summer barbecue moving forward. <laughs> yeah. It's just too much. I, and I see too much, too much of everybody. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little more special when you get together and you're not together three times a week or whatever it is. So we're going to move ours, but, uh, it was fun. Though, like, uh, the- it was, it was good to actually hang out with our team where yeah. no one was DJing. There wasn't music blasting. It wasn't yep. like a nightlife situation. It was like, let's go eat some food and have some drinks and just like get to talk to each other like humans, <laughs> not right. like was- DJs really completely a different vibe than what we're normally used to. Um, cause we went to the holiday party the week before and it was just like blasting music. I couldn't hear anybody. I couldn't even think I was like, get me out of here immediately. Yeah. But, uh, that was a cool, that was a cool party anyways. It was a good venue. Yeah, I mean, but, we're, we're now in the midst of like dead season, right? It's cold in most cities. There's less gigs. I got you know, canceled. There's cancellations. All the private event DJs who are mainly really busy with private events are now kind of back in nightlife. So there's less gigs and more DJs. It makes it uh, it makes it for a, a tough couple months to navigate this this time period. You know? Yeah, it it does. It's it's not. It's this is the time of year where you saved up your money in September and October and November when you're slammed. And now you have like a little reserves because, you know, you're not making what you had been making in the last four months. We have it in the golf industry too, where the summertime down here um, slows up. And what our GM says is you have to save your money from January till Easter 
because you know what happens once like or between Easter and, and Memorial Day kind of slows down a lot. So save your money because you know it's going to be dead season during the summertime. So like you're either going to pick up another job or, you know, get a little part time job on the side or just have, like I said, have those reserves ready. And then we're in that timey time of year right now for for DJing. Um, and you're getting, you're going to have these last minute cancellations. We talked about this a couple episodes ago and how to prepare for that. It was inevitable. It was always going to happen. Yeah. It happens um, every year. And like I said, like I traveled up there to DJ and still got canceled on a Friday night. Like that, like almost can't happen. And it did. And it's just like, you got to roll the punches, made the best of it, jumped around and saw kind of what the Hoboken market was like with what their Friday nights are like, is I'm never over there on a Friday, never really DJing over there, period. And I jumped around and I was like, oh man, Fridays are rough. That, the places that were good were like the more like high end cocktail places. They were good. Like people were like, you know, they dressed nice. They went out, they had an experience as we always talk about. They drank a nice cocktail. They looked good. And they maybe jumped around, jumped to the nightclub where you could still be dressed up and go out kind of a thing. Maybe. But you're down there on the water and it's 15 degrees and, you know, you kind of just you show up and that's where you're going for the night. Yeah. You know, and those places were good. And then the, the, the other places like your regular run of the mill bar, they were slow, you know, and, and, and we've been preaching it forever. Like, you know, provide something else. Right. And uh, I kind of I got, got to see it firsthand. It was kind of wild. Yeah, we I wasn't actually in our nightclub in Hoboken Birch. Um, but, you know, Birch has found a way to be successful in this slow time. And it's it's hard to be a big room and have decent nights. And we've sort of found a way to do that. Now, is it like fall jam-packed lines down the block? No. But there's just so many less people and so much less foot traffic right now. It's It's great to see that, you know, they're still having pretty decent nights and we had zach martino on saturday at birch which was our first like artist booking mm. uh and that was a lot of work and it was I, I think it was a success again i wasn't there but based on my conversations with our team and with some of the djs that were in the building it seemed like it went really well and people were excited uh to see zach now we also set up sort of like a boiler room style D, uh, dj booth on the main floor rather than up high in the VIP area where the, the DJ booth is normally situated. Yeah. So it, it was something different. You know, it was a, bringing a name into the venue. It was moving the DJ booth. It was a lot of different things that I think helped create some excitement and something different in there. So we I'm have our team call see... uh, later today, actually. So I'm excited to hear kind of some oh, feedback sure. from the team that was on site and kind of running the show. I'm interested to hear, to see the content that came out of that, to see what it looked like. You know, I, we've seen the DJs on the floor before, but um, it's been a long time and, and especially in a nightclub setting. Uh, I don't think I've seen it there in a nightclub setting in, in quite some time. So that'll be interesting. Big shout to Zach. He's, he's a great dude and great DJ and local guy for us. So, you know, a nice, easy booking, nice, easy way to use our way into, you know, the, the artist side of things at Birch and, it's a lot of yeah. work, man. There's a lot. It is. There's a lot. I, I was saying, like, I think there was over a hundred emails back and forth with his with his team from the first time we discussed bringing him in to until you know execution of the event. So, yeah, you know, it's a learning experience for me, and it, it was good to go through. But you know, it was a lot of work for sure. Well, speaking of a little, you know, bigger bigger artists and, and, and artist bookings. I mean, you got to, you got to move about the cabin, if you will. And you were up in Detroit and, you know, let us know about how that went and, you know, kind of what their market's like up there. I've never even been to Detroit period. So it was kind of a different, um, have you, have you I have not. It was my first time ever was your first stepping time. foot in the city. So yeah, just give us your full like rundown on, you know, what you thought about the city, what you thought about the, the nightlife vibe and, yeah, and kind of sure. how your nights played out. So first off, I want to shout Pigpen because, you know, uh, Casper linked me with Pink Pigpen and we've had a lot of really good conversations and then went up there and, you know, he showed all the hospitality, picked me up, like all like the whole nine. So huge shout to Pigpen. Uh, we had some really great conversations and I, I actually text RM yesterday. I'm like, he's one of us. Like I had conversations with him the first time I ever met him. Like I had conversations with you. Uh, so that was really cool. It was cool to click with him kind of from jump street and just talk from 
DJ perspective, from a content perspective, from like running a venue and booking DJ perspective. So, you know, the trip was worth it just for that and making that relationship and and connection and having those conversations. It was like, it was great to, to have those high level conversations first and foremost, but yeah, yeah man, like Detroit, Midwest city, right? You've been, I've been to Chicago. I've been to Cleveland. Like it gives me that same similar vibes. Um, it was cold as you know what, like it was freezing. <laughs> I, I kept texting you like, I can't get warm no matter where I go. I'm cold. Like the cold That's... can get through the windows. It was like getting into my hotel room. I had my, it was freezing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so the, the way Detroit is sort of set up, it's like there's downtown Detroit and there's nightclub and nightlife down there. And then there's like Metro Detroit, which are the different areas surrounding the city, right? And I played in one of those surrounding areas at this place called Double O Club. Uh, Pigpen's been bringing in, you know, uh, Booza and Conflict. They have Icon from Houston coming up. So he's been trying to kind of expand and bring in some talent from all over the place. And uh, it, it was a cool room, man. It was, uh, you know, really set up well rectangle you're the dj you're elevated and you see everything sound was good you know the lighting everything like the whole nine smaller room it was pretty cool the way that a lot of the the detroit venues are set up it's like a multi-level building okay and like most of the clubs like there's a restaurant on the on the first floor then nightlife and then maybe like a rooftop or mm. There's a bar restaurant on the first floor and then a nightclub on the second floor. And that just seemed to be like how a lot of these venues were set up. Interesting. So this place was an Italian restaurant on the first floor and then double O on the second floor. And then there's a patio rooftop on the third floor that's open in the summer. So realistically, you can have like three separate vibes in one night. It actually reminds me of the place I played uh, in D.C. with Trizzo. Uh, it was exactly like that restaurant on the bottom. Very then, similar you know, in D.C. where like night the nightlife usually happens on the second floor. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a smart move. I, I, I liked it. I liked the vibe of that. So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we had, you know, the cold going against us a little bit. We also had the Lions playing at home uh, on Sunday afternoon, the next day after my set. So I think, you know, we had a good night for sure. It wasn't a slammed out, jam packed, all the tables sold type of night, which obviously we all hope for when we go play a nightclub. Yeah. Um, but it was still a fun night. I think it was interesting because, you know, I, I prep for all my gigs, this cream thing that I've been doing for the last year of like EDM house forward, you know, you go into these places prepping and planning for one thing, but then you have to be a DJ once you're there, you know? Yeah. And in watching pig pen play the room, it was like, they're not really messing with the with the dance music too much. Like hip hop is working. He was he was dipping in and out. Like he was playing yeah. He was just mat. moving around. You know. Okay. Like like we would do here, just going up and down type of thing. Is that a conversation that you're having like while he's playing? Like oh man, like the house stuff's not kind of popping off. I think this is the direction I'm going to go in when I go no, on. And like we, have, we were we didn't really have a we were we were kind of talking about like they're they're not really messing with the house music like. Right. During our set, we said that I didn't say like, I'm going to do this because of that. I was just in my right. head taking notes of what was going to happen, you know? Okay. So instead of like big cream intro, custom intro, it was like, all right, let's pick up where Pigpen left off and let's make, let's move the room, right? Let's, let's make it happen. So definitely played more of an open format set, but it was just what needed to happen in the room to make it happen and have a good night. You know, we yeah. kept people to the end. I have eventually was able to get into some of the bigger EDM and like tech house stuff that I would normally want to play. But in that moment, I had to be a DJ and say, all right, they're not ready for this big intro. They're, they, we still need to like keep them going and get them on the dance floor and keep them moving, warm them up yeah. a little more. And then we can dip into that bigger stuff. Right. I, yeah, I mean it's it, it's it's why it's so important to to be versatile, right? Because you you don't want to walk into this travel set where there's a lot expect you know a little more maybe not a lot expected of you, but a little more expected of you to like come in and execute a good set, and then you know you can plan through this whole thing prior to your set, and you walk in and you're presented with a completely different set of circumstances, and now you have to kind of 
you, you have to kind of change your path and be good at changing your path. You know, right. I, I think it's a, it's a testament to our market too, because our market is so demanding in so many different styles of music that I feel like no matter where we go, no matter where a New York City, New Jersey DJ goes, you can execute a really good hip hop and or house set, right? Yeah, I it's a training ground here for sure to be able to play all the different mini markets and different styles and it sets you up for success when you do go travel. But my my bigger point as I was standing there and typing our email, like sending emails to the get down about things we wanted to talk about on the podcast, my biggest takeaway was just because someone's paying you to go travel to another city doesn't mean that you don't do what's best for the room, just like you do at home or you should yeah. be doing at home. You know, yep. the same principles that apply to your sets at home apply when you go somewhere else. And, you know, Pigpen's feedback for me was, dude, like you kept the room. I appreciate you playing the way you did kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Because we did keep the room. We ended up having a good night and I think people were happy and hopefully the place made some money and, you know, we did the best we could for what we had. And he even said to me, like, this was one of the slower Saturdays I could remember. But I mean, I think the Lions thing was a huge, huge factor because some of the DJs I talked to the next day were in the venues at like 9 a.m. <laughs> Really? Yeah, it was like one it of was, those days. It was a it was party. Like St. Patty's Day. Or it was like one, one of those, those. days. Yeah. Like, I mean, listen, you know that like especially a big game like that, you know, and you're advancing into the the conference, uh, the championship, the conference championship, like, you know, everybody's showing up, home game, et cetera. And like, even if they were playing away, not to say that that would affect your crowds on Saturday night, but it would still be a spectacle the next morning right. anyway. People were still going to be going out to party and be in the bars. Right. So having it be a home game, it's like, you know, it's not that you have it stacked against you, but, you know, people are, are definitely saving their energy for the next day and they're going to party all day long, you know, especially if they win, you know, and that's luckily kind of how it went down. Right. Yeah. It was really cool to be in the city on Sunday. Like pig pen took me to get Coney Island dogs from like Lafayette. They have like, that's like a big thing there. They do like the hot dog thing. There's literally two places right next to each other that like compete for the best. It's like white mana <laughs> sort of if they were next nice. to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we got dogs. He kind of showed me around the city. We said, what's up to some DJs, uh, you know, said, what's up to, uh, I don't know, just some of the heavy hitters for Detroit. I think uh, right. it was cool to link with some of those guys and check out some of the the big club rooms that are that are down there. Yeah. So Sunday was awesome. It was just cool to be around all that energy and people were really hyped, man. Like, what was your uh, take on hearing DJs from Detroit and like the style that they played? And were were styles very similar? Did guys play differently? Like. I feel like you kind of go out up by us and you, you can jump around and you hear a lot of the same music in a way. And yeah. You hear it also like mixed in a certain way as well. So, so like, like we said, like a little bit of hip hop, a little bit of house, some Latin, like a little bit of everything, you know? Yeah. Like what was the style up there? Um, so, I mean like, like pig pen opened the room, how I would have opened the room. Like he opened it perfectly. It was like, a lot of times, you know, when you like open your computer and you're starting to prep your set to go on, like a lot of times I'm prepping that, like, all right, we're not ready for, for a peak hour intro. So I'm going to hit some of my like go-to tracks to get people hyped that are popular. And like, he hit all that stuff leading up to me going on. So I'm like, Oh, he's, this is perfect. Like, this is what I would have right. done. Right. So in, hearing him and hearing that room, it was like very similar to what we would do at home in your top 40 club, right? You're going to yeah. go up and down. You're going to play some big room EDM. You're going to play those all the, 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 the new hip hop, you're going to play the classic hip hop, the no hands, the soldier bowl, like all that stuff. What works here yeah. works there in, in that style of club. Right. And I was thinking like, man, like, is it now just a case of there's less like regionality in music, especially in the, the top 40 EDM open format rooms? Um, but then on Sunday, I was like, all right, maybe there is more regionality because we I heard some hip-hop DJs, you know, like 42 Doug is from Detroit. So there was some 42 Doug. There was like 
specific songs get played at the Lions game that I had never heard of. So yeah. I definitely heard some different stuff on Sunday and it made me think about like our hip hop scene here, right? And we had a conversation mm-hmm. before this off air, like the locks back in the day kind of thing, or like I, even Ice Spice right now and some of the drill artists. Yeah, it's, I feel like those sporting events specifically do also bring out that regionality exponentially, right? You know, if the Rangers or the Yankees are playing, like you're going to play stuff that's played in Yankee Stadium to like create that kind of excitement and that kind of vibe. Or right. like, you know, certain songs to, you know, certain batters that are coming up, you're going to you're going to lean into those songs. You're going to lean into, you know, whatever the defensive stop uh, song is, because I'm just thinking like the Giants defensive stop song offhand. And like I always play that right before the game. Um, at the bar that I'm playing at before a Giants game. So like, and then also you're going to, I always lean into like a more of a Jay-Z in New York city hip hop scene when I'm, when I'm playing those big sporting event prior to those big sporting events. So I could see where those days really highlight the region and what the music is that comes out of that region, old or new. Yeah. Um, I think you're going to see that more on those days more than you would in the nightclub. I think in the nightclub, yeah, it'll be featured and like, but not in such a large, like a a long format way. Like you might hear like two regional tracks back to back and then maybe 30 minutes from them again and and, and so on and so forth. Um, I saw that in DC where like a lot of the regular stuff was hitting And then people would come up and be like, well, you know what? This song really hits here well. So like, can you go into like these one or two tracks? Yeah. You know, and and that you kind of built on that kind of, kind of vibe. And I feel like you're right. It's not like you walk into a nightclub anymore and it's like, oh my God, it's all of this music. I don't know from this part of the world or this part of the country. And like, I know what none of this stuff is, you know, it's, it's like, oh, I can get away with playing here with also doing a little bit of homework. Yeah. I agree. I think the the hip hop is way more regional than the EDM or house stuff. You know, and th- you know what? It it just hasn't gotten to. Not that it hasn't gotten to the point. Oh my god! I'm just thinking about this. It used to be like that. No, that's in not, house. I music. agree. It used to really be like that, and now it's not like that. Like if you were, I mean, Chicago house and Detroit house. I texted you. You know, I, Chicago house and Detroit house and New York City house were all completely different sounds back. You know back when it was all considered regional music. Yeah. And the DJs that played in New York, sure, you can go play in Chicago, but it didn't translate as as well. You know? Yeah. I feel like maybe the Detroit-Chicago exchange might have been a little easier, but the New York sound was just so onto itself, you know? It's funny. Like, we were talking about Detroit as the birthplace of techno, and there's a lot of... Uh, like house and techno and and house specific venues there. It reminded me of like the Williamsburg slash Brooklyn house scene compared to like the Manhattan top 40 bottle service scene where like Brooklyn looks down on on Manhattan, like the Detroit techno scene looks down on the top 40 scene a little bit. It's like the same, same vibe. Detroit techno scene is, Detroit techno scene has always looked down upon everybody. (laughs) That was the only thing I didn't get to experience out there. Um, You know, like they were talking like, do you want to go to afters? And I'm like, nah, I really don't. (laughs) Like I'm trying to, I'm tired. Like I've been traveling. (laughs) Like it would have been cool. It would have been cool to check out one of those parties for sure. Uh, Maybe the next time I'm out there, we can plan for an extra, an extra day or stay a Sunday night or something to check out one of those parties. Yeah. It would be worth the time because there is so much history there in house music in America. It was just, it was such a scene before house music was popular here, you know? And, and like I said, those three cities were, were, were on top of the the scene before it was anything in the United States. It was a good trip, man. I had, I had a good time, uh, you know, hoping to be back there. We're going to have pig pen out here and kind of run the circuit and play some, some venues here. So we should definitely have him on the show at some point, maybe like when he's in town, we can record a pod and yeah. Kind of talk about some of these things more. Yeah, definitely. We'll but um, depth. man, I don't remember what we had on our on our list here. <laughs> um, let's get into a conversation I was having with Pigpen, and we brought up something like if you could pick one artist to be and like travel their career path, who would it be, and why? 
I have a, I have so, I have so many like influences and people that I follow, have followed for many years and, and saw their ups and downs and their different ventures. I mean, career path. I feel like this is going to be a wild one. I feel like Kanye West for me had this amazing career path. Mental health stuff aside, outlandish shit aside. Right. Like the last couple of years have kind of tarnished that a bit. (laughs) Sure. Yes. But I'm thinking about like, if you're just thinking about like career and not like stepping out of line and saying the wrong thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if this is not, I want to be Kanye West, this is, I would take that career path as far as the opportunities that get presented, right? Putting your, working your ass off to get in front of you know, Jay-Z and Rockefeller back in the day and trying to get your chance and being brushed off as a hip hop artist and then being able to produce your own album and have it be a wild success and change even what fashion looked like within the hip hop community and then dabble into fashion and then become this, you know, Yeezys became this huge thing and he was involved with LVMH and, and he was involved with all of these different companies in a very positive way. He, anytime that he stepped into these roles, whether, it, whether it was, you know, in production in, in being an actual rapper and then also being accepted into the fashion industry, he always elevated what those, uh, what those positions looked like, right? Like his, he came in with a different sound on every, on every album. Right, he revolutionized what hip hop sound sounded like on every album, and you, if you remember correctly, in every album, everybody's like, "This is whack." And then all of a sudden, a year later, everybody's best producing album of all time. It's the best album of all time, and everybody else is emulating what he was doing, right? Like changing the BPMs like with the Chipmunk, uh, the Chipmunk produ- 808, production, 808 and Heartbreaks. Like, well, yeah, you had the Chipmunk production, which was kind of a big thing in the mixtape scene in the mid '90s uh, with mashup DJs that would put together, you know, uh, R and B, R and B, um, instrumentals with hip hop acapellas. Right. And then he took that and he put that and made that mainstream. Right. And then used a lot of like those soul samples and really made it mainstream and, and, and kind of elevated what, what, uh, Puff Daddy was doing back then. And then like 808s and heartbreaks, like got into the electronic kind of a scene. Um, it was kind of what was happening in the, in the nightclubs at the time. That was like around the DJ AM time where like they were, you were having a revolutionary time in music there. So like, you know, bringing in more of like a dance presence into, into the hip hop scene. Um, and then just getting involved in clothing and fashion, something that I, I love and I'm passionate about. And, and I think that would be like a really cool venture to go down and really making an impact on the fashion scene across the board as outlandish as it might've been people still bought this ridiculously priced stuff because like he was just an impact. Um, like I said, all of like the political shit and the craziness aside, like I, I think the, just the impact in, in, in many different ways was very cool. So I, I really like his, his career path. Yeah. Kanye was definitely one of the artists we discussed for sure. Uh, and coming from, you know, my passion for hip hop is sort of what got me sparked in this in this music industry. A lot of the people that I thought of were hip hop producers that then went on to do something else, you know. So Kanye was one. I think Pharrell is another one that you is in the conversation for sure. Yeah. Uh, he's been in bands. He's produced music for every artist you can think of: pop music, hip hop music. He's, he's also fashion icon esque. Right. right. Fashion icon ask who's now what creative director for Louis Vuitton. Like, right. That's a pretty prestigious and unique role to take on, you know, at towards the end of your music career, for sure. Uh, Initially, like his whole like skate style was different and like different to the scene. I mean, that whole his whole style of producing music was different. Yeah. Unique time. sound for sure, which set him apart perspective. Um, I'm trying to think. And I, then like he got involved in doing like Disney stuff and Despicable Me with with Happy was huge right. and, and all of that stuff and I, I was reading and he produced like five tracks with Hans Zimmer who's this like um, incredible composer like he's done a lot of great things yeah. outside of any realm that that really anybody gets into. Yeah, I, I think his his career path has been incredible and definitely one that any of us would 
be interested in having for sure. Some other ones, uh, Justin Timberlake. What do you think about that one? I love Justin Timberlake for <laughs> many reasons. <laughs> I, mean, Jay, I mean, listen, take away like the child star thing or like, I, you know, that's a little weird to kind of mess up your childhood. But besides that, you know, mega pop star, mega me, in a group, mega pop star as an individual actor. What else has he done? I mean, he's he's kind of at the top of the top. a ton of golf courses. Thank you very much. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> he's a nasty golfer. I, I mean, that that guy... Whenever he posts like his foursomes on the weekends, I'm like, geez, like Michael Jordan, Steph Curry, yeah, you know, you name it. He's he's they played at his golf courses. He owns some really prestigious country clubs and and nice nice play, nice courses. Yeah, um, I think the, speaking of him coming back, the other one <laughs> that that not as big of a of a superstar, I don't think, as some of these other names, but probably potentially my choice. I haven't, I'm, you know, I'm not going to hang my, uh, my gold star in any one of these, but the alchemist. And the reason, wow. why, the reason why I say the alchemist is because like he's produced a hip hop in a style that I just really resonates with me. And he's worked with some of my favorite artists, like mob deep dilated peoples, like action Bronson, like the list goes on of all the artists that he's worked with in more of like an underground sort of way. Yeah. Um, which was always th- what I was into, um, but then became really popular mainstream and uh, is now on like a, a food show, you know, like fuck that's delicious with action Bronson and on tour with action Bronson. Like I love food. And if I could somehow parlay my music career into like a food career, that would be pretty awesome to me. Really loved his and love his personality on that show. Not like, you know, he, he seems like he'd be like kind of a dry kind of dude but yeah. like really good personality on that show and and really within the last year he's made such an impact on the music industry from a production standpoint in the fact that he's gone completely solo he's he doesn't now um mess with any labels and he's putting out his music independently fully independently um and i think that it's impacting the way some producers are going about putting their music out and rightfully so like he you know what he produces his stuff and and he wants to um reap the benefits of that right and he doesn't want all of these different hands in his pocket uh now is that easy to do from somebody on an upstart no but you know he has the credentials and the and the history and and the success so He's able to do that, which I, I think is super dope. What I also think is super dope that he's been doing lately is he'll create like a full album with one artist. So it'll be like, uh, I'm trying to think of who he's like Larry, the Larry June and Alchemist project was like one of the bigger hip hop projects from 2023. Yeah. Like, I think that's super cool. He's sort of always done that where he's produced a full album for, for an artist and they put it out together. I, I just love that style and he can kind of provide a certain sound for all these different artists. Like Earl now, the Sweatshirt and the Alchemist, Rock Marciano and the Alchemist, Mike Wiki and the uh, and the Alchemist. So, like, I just think that's a pretty cool way to put out music and collaborate with other artists as a full album. It's pretty cool. It it really showcases the uh, like diversity in in the in the producer's skill. I think number one. Um, I think that I was just going to ask, like, was that like a is that like a Bronson thing that he took? Because Bronson would always do that. Like he'd do a full album of Party Favor, then he'd do a full album of Alchemist, then he'd do a full album with. No, um, I mean he's been doing that forever. He has. Then I was thinking back, and he has. Yeah. right? Like he produced like a full Mob Deep album, full Mob Deep, full Dilated Peoples. Right. I mean, there's been a lot. I'm trying to think of who yeah. else. I'm now trying to think back if that was like a normal thing, or did everybody always kind of dip into different producers? Or if like producers with a rapper was always like a premiere used to do it, but I can't necessarily think of a whole ton of albums that were just one producer. Obviously, I mean, Wu-Tang with RZA, but that's a little different. Right. It's a group mentality kind of a thing. What about I thought when you initially asked this question, I have like a, my first like gut instinct and this is a little cringeworthy thought was like john summit because well that's what i was gonna say what about in the dance world right like we mostly talk about dance music on this pod so what what dance world and I, john summit was one i thought of as well 
my knee jerk reaction was John Summit because I feel like he does. I've said this before. He does such a good job in like documenting like what a day in the life of John Summit looks like. I'm like, I would love to do that. This looks like a like a lot of work. Like he's not he's not shy of playing two or three shows in a couple different time zones in one day and like party throughout the friggin' thing. Jump on his jump on a private jet and like you know just like make it a whole like day and like like make it a day where I'm I'm gonna party. I'm gonna have fun. Like I'm gonna enjoy doing. This is why we do what we do. Yeah. We do this for the for the fun of it. Not that, oh, I'm fucking tired and, you know, I played 19 gigs this month and yada, yada, yada. Like, shut up. Like, you're doing this. It's a great time. <laughs> like, enjoy it. And I think he really highlights the, the, the part of what we do and why people do originally get into this business. It's, it's to make your life. And, and you can have days like that. It's so, you know, it, it's not, we, we can all do it. Maybe not to a private jet standpoint but like you can all you can you can you know make the best of 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 all your gigs and it looks like he does you know and i and and that's just d de- just djing like not business nothing that's just djing john summit is the everyman that's why I, I always call him the everyman because he's kind of lived the career path that like every bedroom not every but a lot of bedroom djs want to live right like you have this shitty accounting job and you're making music in your bedroom and you make your first hit from like your one bedroom apartment. And then you go off onto this journey of being an artist and becoming one of the biggest artists in the world and playing all over the world. So that's like the, I I think when you think of these prototypical or stereotypical, like the artist making it, he's sort of taken that journey, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So he was my like knee jerk reaction when you asked the question. And then, and then when you went more into like business and like getting into different things, older me says, you know, like a, yeah, like a Justin Timberlake or a Pharrell, like we said, or like a Kanye. And then like the DJ in me says, John Summit all day. Yeah. Like, like I wanted a couple other guys day. I thought of were like Fisher, Steve Aoki. They just seem to live these pretty interesting lives. Like Fisher as an ex pro surfer living in Australia, like Probably not a bad gig. <laughs> yeah. Steve Aoki, trust fund baby, turns artist, turns. <laughs> right. You know. Just like created this crazy like playhouse in Vegas and just living like the superstar life out here. Growing up in LA, right? Like, is there really any other career path, right? Like yeah. that's that's the that's the life you you kind of are born into. And and you know, it's nice that he's made a long and very successful career out of it. Like I thought when he first came out and him and AM were doing a lot of stuff together. I was like, Oh, this guy's just going to burn out. This is just going to be a fad. And he's really, he's really done well with, with his brand and, and the trajectory of his career. Yeah. I mean, he's been in the it's game a long see. time, man. It's been a long time. So I, I know we're, we're a little shorter than we normally would go. I actually want to go back to something. Okay. I had it. I actually had another thing to talk about too. Cause I, I had some stuff. All right, come up so in my let's sets. do that. Do that first. It's kind of more of like a, it's like a self-help session actually with, with you, because just to talk this out, I hit like a, um, a part of my sets twice, a two different Saturday sets that like, they start at like nine, nine thirty, and at like one fifteen, I was hitting like a, a wall. Um, like not knowing what to play or just not knowing which or- direction to go in. Right. And oh, probably a little, a little tired. And then also not knowing which direction to go in. Like this past weekend, I was like, Oh, I want to like get into this one genre. And I feel like I kind of forced it maybe a little bit. Um, but then it's like, Oh, well, I don't want to hang in hip hop too long. This is the issue with having such an open format room. Like in, in the room that I was this pa- past Saturday, like I can get away with, I can get away with class at that time, classic house, R and B mainstream hip hop. You just name it big time EDM. Like I was just like at a point where I'm like, I kind of don't know where to go here. Um, and it happened two weeks in a row. And I was wondering kind of throwing this out there and throwing this out there for all DJs. What do you guys do? You know, comment in the comments here. Uh, what do you guys do when you get stuck? Like, do you have a go-to folder is there like go to tracks that you go to that you that you you know go seek out in your Serato, um, or am I just overthinking it? You know what I mean. And that could be it too. Well, I know the room that you're talking about, and I sort of run into the same the same issue when I'm there. Um, that well, that room, and then also upstairs as well. There, I thought you were that, talking that, about. I thought you were talking about no, upstairs. 
So oh, well, upstairs and downstairs, both. I, I ran into the same issue, same time, both times. So I think part of part of the issue here is certain when a venue doesn't necessarily have an identity, it makes it a lot harder, right? If the venue has a general identity of why people go there and what they expect, you can kind of just go dig into whatever that is, right? Yeah. Like whatever the old faithful in that particular room is. But when you're playing in a room that's very open format where the ages can vary very, very greatly, you never know if there's 20 year olds or 40 year olds in the room. Um, I personally tend to go to like the classic party anthems in whatever genre. Usually it's hip hop. So like, hmm. it, again, I mentioned soldier boy er earlier, but like soldier boy and like be faithful and like, Anything Drake that's super popular, I yeah. kind of just hit some classic, I don't know, classic stuff. And that sometimes sparks a whole new run of, of music that I wouldn't have normally thought of. I think at that point, like, right, I'm four hours in, I've already, I've played every genre of music that there is, you know, everything that works in that room that's acceptable has been played. Yeah. Um. I also go very energetic very early. Well, that's the other thing. You start your main room set way earlier than I normally would. I didn't know yeah, that's I was changed doing, since COVID. I just do it. I don't know. I just like that feeling of having a lot of energy early in just to kind of create a vibe when it's maybe not as crowded. Yeah. Um, like it's crowded, but it's not packed. Per se. So this is another, this is, this is something that I need, I think everyone needs to readjust all these venues because we used to open rooms and play rooms a certain way. And it was the opener was playing a certain style of music, not nothing new, nothing super high energy. I find that mm -hmm. after COVID, all of these places want you to play higher energy earlier. And that's fine yeah. when you have a packed room early and you're staying busy. But now that we're sort of back to this pre-COVID, slower, whatever, I don't think you could do that. I think you need to to build a room, slow down, not hit the big stuff as early, and it'll help carry you through the night and get you to close. Yeah. I, I just, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just old school and have an older school way of thinking, but... I've never been a proponent of going hard early. I don't know. And I see it, I see it in our in the venues where I like maybe I have an opener, they're going too hard, and I have nowhere to go that's higher, and our room yeah. clears out by 145, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. I, and you know, you you can exhaust the crowd too. Right. Right. Um, you gotta give them breaks. I need to review both of my sets and just sit down and see, okay, like this is where maybe I could have pushed this to later. Etc. I think you just need to focus on holding some of the newer stuff till later. I think that's really important. Like you can't hit the top 10 most popular stuff before midnight. If you're staying open till 3 a.m., you just can't. Right. Well, I know like in that room, I know particularly at 2 a.m., I'm going to go to R&B. Right. Right. That's always what's going to happen because there was five or six must plays in there that you cannot touch during because they're too damn slow. You can't touch them from 11 to, to 2. Right. Because it's just way too slow, you know. Um, Twelve to two just, is still like a lifetime of 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 DJ time, you know. Like you could play so much music in that twelve to two hour range. Well, that's why I, I looked at one fifteen, and I'm like, oh my god, I got forty five fucking minutes before I can get into like you know the classic sing along R and B tracks. Maybe that is what I needed to play then to maybe like okay, I'm going to switch the ear up. Let's let's hit these like I know everybody's gonna sing this one particular R and B song. It is nowhere near like the energy of what I'm playing maybe at the time, but maybe try to get down to that track, have everybody sing along, and now you've kind of reengaged. Yeah, I, my strategy in I those rooms sometimes that. is classic reggae, classic reggaeton, so it's kind of like grab them back. Yeah, I don't know. I what I had gotten away from Latin pretty hard this trip up there. Um, I don't know why, just not nothing on purpose. Um, but during my open format sets, I was I was kind of getting away from Latin. I think it's because I played two venues that you play no Latin in, and and that it's like I thinking about it. I have to book my so I I book out so, in so many different venues. You know, a full Latin night, sometimes a country night, and then have to go play. You know, uh, uh, a. Uh, LGBTQ bar and then go play like a 21 year old um, 
college party spot. Like it's so different that like it becomes really hard to when you're trying to pull it all together, it it, it becomes hard because you don't have a night where you're doing that except for one night, maybe a weekend or one night a month. Maybe that is for me. You right. Know what I mean, and being able to do that on the fly without repeating that over and over again is a little tough. Yeah. So the, your point right here was sort of what I wanted to bring up and go back to, which was you had brought up our, our market is so diverse and like every room is a little bit different. It's like every mini little pocket in, in our, in our major market of right. Like Metro New York, right. It's New York city. You play a certain style downtown New York city. You play differently than the, the, than midtown Manhattan. Right. Yeah. Like North Jersey where we live Hoboken, like you could be in one city of Hoboken and it's played a certain way. And the city right next door, Jersey city is played a completely different way. Yeah. And we have to prep for all this stuff and it makes it very hard. But like you said, when we go somewhere else, we're, we're ready for war, right? Cause we have to, we have to be ready for war in our own market. Yeah. And I think that was what you just said was part of the reason why I really wanted to go all in on more EDM, more house, more tech, because I got tired of having to go to war every night. Like, yeah, I want to do what I want to do now. And I book myself in the rooms where I get to do that. You know, I don't play the rooms where I have to go to war and play shit that I don't necessarily want to play. And yeah, I'm going to get away from what you're doing. I'm going to get away from having four completely different sets in a weekend, especially when I'm not, I don't play every weekend, right? I, I get three weekends off and then I come and play. And it's like to do what I'm doing and have that much time off. It's hard. It, it makes it a lot harder. Yeah. You know, because you, you can't test. I can't, I'm not testing records every week and be like, okay, that, that works. It's a throwaway. It's like when I'm there, it's like, there's no testing records. Like I've got to play the stuff that's working. Right. That's why I have to ask. I ask so many questions like, Hey, I love this song. Is this going to work? You know? And people are like, Oh no, that doesn't work. Or it's really good at this time. Or it's really good at that time. I and mean, you could feel it too. But like, if it's a record I've never played before, it's, it's tough. Yeah. You know, so what do you do in, if you're in a more like dance house room, like what's, what do you go to, to try to grab people instantly? Is there any, like, do you have a strategy around that? Um, in more of a dance house room. I don't know. I don't really, I don't play a lot of like house rooms. I just don't like, I keep myself out of, I keep myself out of those rooms because I'm not as well versed in it. And I have everything so subgenred out in my Serato. It's something I was I was thinking about the entire time I was there. I'm like, I think I have everything subgenred too much. And I've gone to go into just the top of my folder and playing out of the full folder, not the subgrades. And I like it better that way. I used to do it. I used to keep everything in BPM. Like, okay, I was oh, I'm gonna play this record. I'm gonna put it in my hundred, hundred ten BPM folder. Yeah. You know, and I, I feel like I, I was more versatile in in how I played. Like I'd play a ACDC record and play a Kanye record afterward. You know what I mean? And, and like I felt like that was more fun. I feel like with house music specifically, I've gotten so like, okay, this is disco and new disco. I'm going to keep that in a folder. I'm going to play three or four of those in a row. This is techno. I'm going to keep that separate. Yeah. Like I don't think that that should always be the case. Especially right now, I feel like genres are sort of blending a bit where it's, it's, we talk about all the time. Like, I don't even know what that technically is. Yeah. But I know it's good. (laughs) I I know over the weekend uh, at 626, I played a bunch of disco and new disco and like high energy, like disco house. I'm getting back into that and it all really, really works in there. Especially early, it keeps really great energy and it, it, and that's, kind of where I start when I'm in there. Cause I know everybody else starts with like R and B or like more vibey stuff. And I'm just trying to be a little different. Um, I don't know. I've been starting that room with like tech house now, just because that's what I want to play. And it sort of works as long as you pick the right tracks. Yeah. So it's been cool. Yeah, you can. I, I think to go back and answer my own question, which was like in an EDM or dance room, like what's your go-to or how do you bring people back? 
I tend to think of like, what are those songs that I play from 11 to 12 when I'm trying to take the room from open to peak? Yeah. Like what some of those songs would be. So it's like Calabria, like a remix or an original of Calabria, like Sean Paul Temperature, the Revis remix, which I played probably more than any other song in the last five years. Yeah. Uh, like uh, Sean Kingston, Fireburn and Angelo the Kid edit. Like I have some go-tos that I just know the vocal hits and it's high energy that can kind of grab the room. Like I kind of pop. I love it. We'll always get people excited no matter where you are. Yeah, that leans into my like eleven forty five, right? But like at at peak, right before peak, right. But I'm know. saying if you like hit a lull later in your set and you're in a, in one of those rooms, like what can you go to to grab them again? And I just think of that stuff. What do you play during that eleven forty five set? And like go to that folder, right. yeah. And that's how you kind of get them back because that's how you sort of get them going in the first place, you know? Right. True. So that's maybe approach it. those open format rooms with well, what would I play if it was eleven thirty in the room? or 11.45, and we're getting ready to go to peak and like maybe go play some of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I got to go and review it and see kind of where where I got where I went wrong. And I, I think it's important for a lot of DJs to do, right? Like if you feel like you had a little lull in your set, we all know it. Like you get that feeling in your stomach. You're like, shit, I'm a little stuck. Go back and see where you felt like you got stuck. See what you played before it. See what you played after it. And there's always that one or two tracks that, quote unquote, get you in trouble, I guess you could say, that were flat, that fell flat, right? Yeah. And that's where you're like, okay, well, you could omit that. And what can I put in that place in order to, to not have that flatness? We're, we're not afforded songs anymore. I talked about this with a couple of our DJs on our calls. You're not afforded a flat song as a headliner. You're just not. You have to come, like every song needs to be something that hits. Somebody in the room needs to be singing to it, dancing to it, recognize it. You cannot, you can't flatten the, the the energy out in a room. I think it's okay to maybe miss on one, but anything beyond one or maybe two songs in a row that don't hit, like you have to recognize that and get out of there ASAP. And sometimes think, that's just like spinning out and getting the fuck out of there no matter where you are and just like slam, slamming something. You kind of just have to do it every now and again. I think I'm a little tough on myself where I, I hate, I hate having a, I don't like to have a, a song that even remotely doesn't hit. Not even like remotely, like some, like there needs to be a minor reaction somewhere in the, in the room. Every song. Yeah. I, it's just the way I go about my sets. Yeah, I mean, you're probably and just like, tough on yourself too. I think a lot of this is like, you expect a certain a level out of yourself. And if you're not getting that, or, and you're so used to getting reactions from everything you play that when you don't, it's like, what the right. fuck's going on? Right, right. I, I think it's working out of that mentality maybe a little bit too. Uh, you know, it's definitely part of it. Because what happens then is like, shit, like I missed on that song and dwell on that for more than a song or two. Like you just can't, you got to move on. Right. Survive like in advance. You just got to get <laughs> out like of golf. it. It was a bad hole. I got to move on. Yeah. Be positive on the next one. <laughs> so... All right. I think this is a good point to wrap. I know you got to jump off. Uh, yeah. So thank you guys for listening to this episode of the get down. Is there anything we need to promo here? Uh, cheesy's parties tonight. Anybody in New York city, cheesy, uh, a single release party at dingaling lower East side disco vibes all night. If anybody's down, uh, be dope. also I haven't really teased this or put this anywhere, but I decided to put out a cream, Top 10 edits of 2023. I'm going to put that out on Thursday. Nice. So that will be available for download, SoundCloud, Hype Edit, all that good stuff. It'll be a mix and then 10 tracks free free download. I'm going to download it because I'm sure I don't have any of them. I put the mix <laughs> together. I'm like, wow, I play all these. This is great. Like, this really is my top 10. I play all these songs. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm going to have new music. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode. We'll talk to you guys soon. Peace. All right, guys. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Get Down Podcast. If you enjoy our show and find the topics entertaining or helpful in any way, we would greatly appreciate if you could subscribe, rate, and review our podcast wherever you listen to it. We want to help more DJs, and subscribing, rating, and reviewing the show is the best way for us to do that. We appreciate all the love so far. Thanks for listening, guys.